Childhood. This is the sound of childhood right here. That's right. How you all doing? Well, the thing happened, everybody. The thing happened. Welcome to the show. It's 6.59 and 58 seconds on the East Coast. It's quite frankly, it's the beginning of the new week. April 8th, 2024. And the Yankee game started about an hour ago the yankee game i paid 444 dollars for to bring my family to to have a a fun day at the ballpark for eclipse day at yankee stadium and now my last chance for getting my money back is paypal we'll see because Ticketmaster already told me well you can give them away i've tried i i I, this morning on twitter i i pretty much put myself out there and said if you're in the tri-state area and you want four good seats to today's game versus the Miami Marlins, get in touch with me. Um, I was just gonna transfer them to somebody. Didn't even care about making money back or even breaking even or anything like that. It's just there's four empty, well, there's probably a lot of empty seats. It's the Marlins. Um, And of course they they stiffed over probably thousands of other people who were able to go to a two o'clock game and couldn't go to a six o'clock game for one reason or another. Anyway, I was never going to miss this night with you. So, Yankees. That was going to be my first time in that stadium since November 2019. And my first attempt going back, they they bait and switch me and take $400. <laughs> you sons of bitches. You bitch of sons is terrible. Absolutely terrible. But you know what? Unfortunately, I'm blind. I can't see a damn thing right now. I did. I I looked up at the sun for a, a split second. Gone. Done. Feel like Al Pacino in Scent of a Woman right now. It's all over. How I'm doing this right now is beyond me. But we have Jeff Harmon on tonight. Going to be doing a little bit of a, I don't know, just a, a, I'm, I'm more in, uh, interested in how Jeff, somebody like Jeff, we talked to Robert Phoenix last week as a preview, but now since we are, it's after the fact, I mean, what was he going to observe? Something strange happening with the eclipse? It was going to be an eclipse, but, um, and, and there was nothing that makes the natural phenomenon any less cool. I mean, it's awesome. It's nature. Nature is awesome. So that's enough reason to be excited for it, um, as it is, if you are in any way, shape, or form uh, near enough to see something happen. I mean, even with 90%, it was pretty incredible. But still, with 90% of the sun blocked, it was a strange kind of light that we had. It was, uh, you you guys know, it's like a pale, strange, weak kind of light. Like somebody put a forty watt uh, bulb of, uh, above us. It was it was cozy, but it got cold and whatever. But still, it was uh, it was decent. You can have yourself a nice game of catch and not lose the ball. But um, but it's crazy what that last ten percent does, because I saw the videos. Many of the people in this audience are were in the path of totality, and all we were able to do is watch you know news reports and live streams this and that. And it's breathtaking when the lights just go out. But it's crazy how much 5 to 10% of the sun can provide. Crazy. Because to go from what we had, you, you would think at 90%, we'd be like, uh, you know, it would be like, I don't know, 8.30 p.m. on a June, late June evening, early July. It's just like, okay, it's the, the lights are almost out. No, no, it's pretty good. Pretty good. Anyway. Just want to see where how this all stacks up for Jeff Harmon because every time he comes on, we're talking about events on the timeline toward the proverbial 
Phoenix rising from the ashes moment. And what kind of burning, what kind of burning um, society uh, needs to experience before that that revival is um, is next up on is next up on the experience list. So this will be uh, it'll be interesting. I don't I just don't have that and a couple other basic questions and I'll be it. It'll be a shorter appearance than usual with Jeff Harmon because if we're just a solitary topic. I think that it's pretty pretty uh I don't know pretty simple and then afterwards your calls and i have a couple other things in the second half to do the the mixed news i have here tonight is fun thank you to our sponsors bluemonsterprep.com uh ladies and gentlemen if the lights go out for real you're going to need stuff that's on bluemonsterprep.com's uh, website go ahead and do it thank me later you can thank me by uh keying up on your walkie talkies and saying hey frank thanks man Thanks, man. You know, while everybody else is like, ooh, what's going on? Anyway, bluemonsterprep.com. Here is the first one up. This is from Oddity Central. I love this site. $30 million cash storage facility heist leaves everyone baffled. On Easter Sunday, forgot to talk about this. The day after. On Easter Sunday, someone managed to access the Garda World cash storage facility in Silmar and steal a whopping $30 million in what is considered the largest heist in Los Angeles history. Canadian security company Garda World offers cash storage and transportation services, ensuring that clients' money is kept safe until it can be used or deposited in a bank. Such storage facilities are among the best guarded places in the world featuring dozens of guards, alarms, seismic motion uh, seismic motion detectors, and state-of-the-art surveillance, making would-be thieves think twice about attempting a heist. And yet, in what could only be described as a perfect script for an Ocean's Eleven-style blockbuster or Goodfellas, someone recently managed to breach a cash storage facility in Silmar and disappear with up to $30 million in cash without anyone even noticing until a day later. It's almost like the... Um, Jesus' tomb opens like <laughs> just as surprise, I'm sure. The Los Angeles Police Department and the Federal Bureau of Investigation are currently investigating the Garda World heist that occurred on Easter Sunday, but according to several sources, they are still trying to figure out how someone could pull it off. Gaining access to a cash storage complex like this is one thing, but navigating the premises without setting off any alarms, opening the safe without leaving a trace, and getting away with tens of millions of dollars requires preparation, skill, and information. Wow. $30 million is a challenge to itself in cash. The weight of $1 million in $100 bills alone is about 22 pounds. Really? That's it? But if it was in various denominations, that weight can reach 250 pounds. That means that $30 million could have weighed up to 7,500 pounds. So carrying it out of the facility without drawing attention is nothing short of impressive. Wow. You know, I'm just going to take a shot at this. If you are one of the people who stole the money, call me. On the show. You can pick a pseudonym. Pick a name. Call me. I want to hear from you. We'll have time in the second half tonight. Please, please give me a call if you've stolen this money. Here's another one for you. And gentlemen, pay attention. A man undergoes penis enlargement surgery and ends up suing the doctor for erectile dysfunction. A 40-year-old Italian man took a... I'm 39, by the way took a doctor and two medical clinics to court after paying for a penis enlargement procedure that he claims left him with impotence and erectile dysfunction. The unnamed man from Tuscany, Italy, allegedly paid a cosmetic surgeon 5,000 euros for a penis enlargement procedure, but after about a month, he ended up calling the doctor to complain about physical discomfort. This was only the beginning of a painful odyssey that saw the patient undergo a total of 12 procedures in an attempt to fix the initial botched surgery. My sex change operation got botched. My guardian angel fell asleep on the watch. According to court documents obtained by Italian news media, the man had two lipo-filling operations uh, in which fat from various parts of his body was transferred to his penis 
Who touched my penis? Uh, in an attempt to fix the blah, 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 he to, 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 to various parts of the body to transfer to his penis in order to adjust its shape. Unfortunately, they did not have the desired effect as the man's genitals did not maintain the expected shape and volume. Listen, just whatever it is, accept it. Don't, just whatever it is, just accept it. Good, bad, or indifferent. Just please, this sounds like such a nightmare. I guess that's supposed to be him with, <laughs> what is he, he's upset? Photo, photo of just like an upset guy. <laughs> It's not really him. I love how they they uh, they support these these articles with random pictures. Now, if I've ever seen a man who was upset about his sec his uh his 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 penile implant surgery, that's it. That's the that is what a man who's upset about his penile implants looks like. That right there in the smoky room and everything. What is that? A bed? Is that a pullout bed? Sofa bed? Looks like a very thin mattress. This guy's life sucks. So there you go. Compensation was set to 150,000 euros, but the patient ended up with only around 110,000 euros because the court ruled that 30% of the damage, damage he had sustained to his genitals was his own fault. The man admitted to administering injections he claims were prescribed by the same doctor to his penis at home, which the court decided had contributed to the deformity and the erectile dysfunction. Why is he injecting himself? What? Oh, just, it never ends. Sometimes I wish the devil comet had hit the planet and not just passed by. Let's see here. Here's a, here's a headline for you. This one should be easy. Woman diagnosed with Noah's syndrome. She kept 159 cats in her apartment. Now, Noah... Are we talking about Noah and his ark? Because Noah had two of each animal, not 159,000 giraffes. A 68-year-old French woman, leftist, diagnosed with Noah's syndrome, has been given a one-year suspended sentence for keeping 159 cats and seven dogs, those poor dogs, in her 80, oh, 861-square-foot apartment. Okay, I think that the studio... Studio A, the broadcast room of Studio A is about 400 square feet. So I'm trying to think about the, the studio room, the broadcast room doubled in size and filled with 160 cats and seven dogs. The unnamed woman and her 52-year-old male partner, oh, it's not worth it, bro, got into a dispute with neighbors in their niece apartment building because the mess and the filth caused by dozens of pets. Uh, police were eventually called and the state of the woman's apartment shocked them. There was an animal excrement everywhere, of course, over 150 cats and seven dogs, as well as at least two dead cats and two dogs in the bathroom. Many of the animals were dehydrated, suffering from malnutrition or infected with parasites, and some of them subsequently died because of their health problems. Noah's syndrome. So it has a... It has a um, a name. Just for those of you who did not know, it has a name. I think it's wrong if you're just like all, if it's just like one, you know? I think it's a wrong uh, label. I think it's mislabeled. Noah did not bring on 159 cats. Maybe one or two snuck up there. Maybe. All right, the rest is going to be for later on. We're going to get this one started. Jeff Harmon is coming on. And ladies and gentlemen, we will be right back. Don't go anywhere, ladies and gents. Don't go anywhere. Going to be a good one. Hold on a second. That's right. Okay, BRB. Behold, Simi. Life. Real life. A thing that we have been denied for far too long. Good morning, my neighbors. Yes! Yes! Fuck you too!
You let one ant stand up to us, then they all might stand up. Those puny little ants outnumber us a hundred to one. And if they ever figure that out, there goes our way of life. It's not about food. It's about keeping those ants in line. That's why we're going back. Does anybody else want to stay? Let's run! Did anybody take advantage of the Did anybody take advantage of the eclipse today to get some really high quality perineum tanning in? Gentlemen, did you sun your balls? Did you know? I mean, apparently just looking up there must have been like a supercharged UV today because just looking up your your eyes are done. Done. Done screaming. Don't don't Covering up all of your loved one's eyes if they lift them beyond uh, beyond eye level. So that's what they're trying to take away from us. They wanted they wanted to make sure that that this nobody in this country ever even considered tanning their perineum today in the middle of a supercharged supercharged solar event. That's what we got going on over here. Hey, something else happened. I got to show you. Before we get uh, Jeff Harmon on the line, listen to this. Uh, listen to this thing right here. This is incredible. Here is a USA Today from April fifth. This is from Friday. Headline: The surge in short sort of froze. Man getting vasectomy during earthquake on Friday recounts the experience. Can you imagine that? More. I don't know. This this guy snipping. I don't know why they do this. East Coast was caught by a surprise 4.8. While plenty of people took to social media to discuss the unprepared and surprised by the tremble, one man may trump them all. After all, he was in the middle of receiving a vasectomy when the shaking began. The surgeon sort of froze, and all of us kind of seemed a bit confused, he told USA Today. At first, Allen thought the shaking was caused by a train passing by or some sort of issue with the building itself. Assuming it was a common occurrence, it was only when his doctor said something he realized might have been Mother Nature. Even when the surgeon said, that's got to be an earthquake, I thought he was joking. It was an experience none of us would ever forget. Everything went smoothly. I am <laughs> I am no longer the man I was uh, from birth until this moment. Everything went smoothly. I've transformed myself, and we were able to get the procedure completed. But it was something that we couldn't help but laugh about the whole rest of the way. Well, I don't know. Unless there's a medical reason to get a vasectomy, I don't think there is one. I think it's just like a, uh, we don't, I, I, I don't know, just, that just makes me curl cringe. That just makes me feel weird. You know, you know, like it feels, it gives me like elevator, elevator uh, balls. Fellas, you know, like when we're on an elevator and we're going up or we go down and then we come for a stop and you just feel you feel it in the balls. That's kind of gives me that kind of weight. Anyway, I'm just uh, I'm just happy to bring on our guest tonight. It's been a long time. Actually, you know, it's been a couple of months and I always like checking in with uh, with Jeff Harmon along the way. And this is just a significant thing because um, I have to imagine has holds a lot of weight in his line of work. Um, and uh, and now he's on with us tonight to talk about where we are in the timeline toward the Phoenix Rising. Uh, Jeff, do you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you good. Can you hear me? I can. You always sound fantastic. Well, it's All great, right. great good. to have you on in this a uh, little bit of short notice. But I'm really thrilled that we actually uh, had you available. Have you been? All right, getting, man. You've been getting lit up for calls. I have to imagine. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm getting pretty busy. I got. Well, I've been busy. I'll tell you that. Been very busy. Yeah. 
Well, tell me this. All all media hype aside, did you have any expectations outside of observing one of nature's more spectacular displays or uh, anything that you were looking for in particular? No, I mean, I, 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 you know, the astronomy of the eclipse is one thing. What it means astrologically is quite another. And, you know, what I think this is is a setup for what's going on in the world and as well as what's happening in the United States right now. It's very, very, very powerful. The, the main thing that I see happening right now, see, the eclipses are like an imprint into the celestial matrix, and it stays there for a long time. So this eclipse's effect will probably last over the next several years. And what's most important, see, Mercury went retrograde right before this eclipse. And what's powerful on that is Mercury is going to station and go through the eclipse point right on the 11th more. And it's also going to hit the sun. So here's the most important thing is Mercury stations right on this eclipse and goes direct. And then we got Mars and Saturn going uh, to a conjunction here on the 10th, which is two days from now. When Mars crosses the eclipse point in May, that's when I think the fireworks are really going to start. And it could happen before that. But I really think the United States is in a roller coaster year because of this election, as well as we're seeing all kinds of things heat up around the globe with potential war in the Middle East. You know, you got Iran being targeted here a little bit. Iran's never going to be a threat to the United States overall. But terrorist stuff is really going to, I think, ramp up. And that's where I think this eclipse lies is what does it mean? You know, not just, wow, it's cool, the, you know, the sun was darkened down by the moon. But this was actually an eclipse that started in the 1500s at the North Pole. See, they, they rate eclipses by what they call sero cycles. The Chaldeans and the Egyptians and many of the Mesopotamians, they knew that these eclipses were, were they actually have a birth chart when they're formed at the North or South Pole. So this one began at the North Pole in 1501. It actually ends in about 2745. But this ties in much deeper to a lot of events that are happening back in 2017, back in 2020, the, the whole COVID thing. And I think this ties into 2027 too, which is between 27 and 28 is when I see the quote-unquote new one world order making another major push forward. And I would suspect that's going to be heavily into finances as well. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I would be there with you as well. I mean, 2030 yeah. is not that long away. There's a lot that needs to be accomplished by these uh, these villains if they're going to get that's what they're going. Yeah. That's at, their goal. At, but, so then you, this is really interesting to you to for you to say that this eclipse that we just lived through actually – be, this whole cycle began in the 16th century, and I was going to ask yeah. you this. You know, when because when you're on, we're always talking about um, all the things, all these things that are going on right now. How do they place on the timeline events leading to that proverbial phoenix rising from the ashes that you bring up? Um, and um, and now that we're talking about a an eclipse, I was wondering. You know, I was actually wondering how important they are along those timelines? Are they accelerants? Are they just markers? Do they magnify uh, something? Uh, not, not even just in a, in a metaphysical way. I mean, even just physically. Like, what what, what, what can you tell us the importance of eclipses overall for, uh, you know? You know, from an astronomical standpoint, an eclipse is simply when the sun and the earth and the moon's orbit line up. It's called the ecliptical path. So that's the astronomy of it. But the ancient lore goes much, much deeper. See, the ancient legend was, this is where the legend of the dragon came through, the medieval dragon. And the dragon is the serpent that swallows the light of the sun and the moon, right? Either on a new moon eclipse like we had today or on a full moon eclipse. And there's a lot more truth to that than meets the eye, even though we know it's just an alignment of the three bodies, which is the sun and the moon and the earth, on the exact same path. That's what a node is. A node is a joining point. But in the ancient lore, it actually is has a lot to do with the demon Nama. That's one of the Western legends. The other legend is it has to do with the demon that snuck in and corrupted humanity. So that's why... The axis tip may have a lot to do with consciousness. And when you back this out and you say, well, wait a minute, 
That's interesting because consciousness of humanity is always shifting. We actually were believed to go into kind of the bottom of the sewer right around the 5th century. And what's fascinating about that is we're eking our way back up to the Golden Age. Now, that really doesn't happen until about 7,000 years from now. Now, a lot of people are saying, you know, we're in the Aquarian Age. I, I don't think so. Uh, my opinion is, and again, I'm not claiming to have the answers, but my math says we get there pretty close when the Hebrew calendar runs out, which is somewhere around 230, 220-something years from now. And that also brings us eking into what they call the Bronze Age. I, I, in fact, people go to my YouTube channel. We did a video on this, which is pretty cool. And it talks about the ages in the yugas that are shown in Vedic and Nadi astrology, which I think might be pretty accurate. And we're on an ascensional path back up. See, this all comes from a 25,000, almost 26,000-year cycle of our solar system around the central sun. And even if you're a flat earther, it still is the celestial model. And what's interesting about this, it's, some people say it's 25,700 something odd years. Others say, no, it's 25,900 something odd years. Whichever it is, and no one knows 100%, I certainly don't claim to. One thing for sure is it seems to happen. And we go through these epochs or time ages, and we are now ascending back up on the ladder. About 2,000 years from now, we are believed to hit the Silver Age, which consciousness will be greatly expanded by them. And of course, this is we hear about this stuff, Lemuria, Atlantis, and all these ancient civilizations where there was free energy and consciousness that was far beyond what we have right now, and awareness of creation. And I think these eclipses are marker points that consciousness ekes through and tragedies are aligned with them often uh, on the blocking of consciousness. But through that, we eke forward. And the phoenix rising out of the ashes thing that you mentioned earlier is a term that I've been using about what might happen to the United States by 2025. See, what we've got right now going on, and this again is talked about on my YouTube channel. Go to uh, Jeff Harmon Vedic Astrologer or Jeff Harmon Astrologer, and you can see this on my YouTube channel. I, I really encourage that because we have a little more time to go through that stuff. And essentially... The United States is going through a Pluto return right now. And you might say, well, what does that mean? Well, that is like a flamethrower. Um, and when you look back through history, most nations or empires either rose and fall on a 250-year mark. It's right around that. And that's the synodic cycle of Pluto around the sun, which is a fancy term that just simply means the time it takes Pluto to orbit around our solar system. So the United States is in that right now. In fact, we will be 248 years old this July 4th of 2024. And not only is it an election year, but if you look at what's happening to this country, they are looting the treasury. In fact, George Washington, I think, said it best. He said, if anyone ever gets to print our money, they're more dangerous than any standing army. Well, <laughs> Wilson gave it to him. And the Federal Reserve Act, which they tout, you know, is the 16th Amendment. But I got to tell you, it is the, it was the beginning of the end of this country's sovereignty. And this is, I think, a war that might be going on between the globalists and the nationalists right now at a level we're not seeing on the mind control news and on normal media. But I, I hear from people who are pretty knowledgeable in certain intelligence locations that this has been a war that's really been going on and it's far far deeper and may get involved with extraterrestrial and, uh, and terrestrial beings on a much deeper level than we know and the united states is such an important country to the sovereignty and freedom of humanity and if anyone takes the time to read the constitution the bill of rights uh, you don't need a brick to fall on your head to know that that is really looking out for the best interest of the human spirit. In fact, the Iroquois Indians were actually consulted on that. So the founding framers of that document was pretty intelligent. And what's happening is right now, the United States is under probably the most vehement internal attacks it's ever been under. Mm -hmm. And it's it's uh, literally happening to every city. 
Uh, not only is the border being flooded, but they're flying people in on the U.N. They are printing money faster than or they are spending money faster than they could print it. And this is a direct attempt by shutting down the energy systems under the climate change guise, and it really is a guise. I mean, when you look at it, it's getting colder, folks, not warmer. And the weather patterns are erratic, but that's largely due to the alignments of the planets. I talk about that on the YouTube channel, too. And the sun. We're going through a grand solar minimum. And they're using this to break the Western nations financially. Because if you cut off viable fuel and you replace it with something that's not replaceable, which is wind and electric cars and trucks, uh, they create more pollution than the gasoline and diesel ever did. By the time you look at manufacturing, charging, and they will destroy this country if they try and implement electric semis. Not going to work yeah. because it takes too long to charge them. You can't haul as much. And the economics is... Who's going to end up paying in the end? The consumer. Prices keep going to the moon. Well, what does that do? That causes more inflation, causes more destruction on the economic things, uh, structures of which they want. And then pretty soon, boom, financial crash. Here's your government stipend. And, and it's on digital currency. So what do we end up with? Then? A high-tech version of communism. And this is where they want it to go. And this Pluto return that is being shown on the astrology of the United States is like clockwork. Even COVID came out like clockwork. So the phoenix rising out of the ashes could potentially happen to us in 2025 because we all also have a progression that's aspecting the United States. It's called the Jupiter primary direction to the sun. Now, if that happens, like I think it's going to, we just might be the phoenix rising out of the ashes. And these eclipses all tie in to the subterfuge and the stuff that's going on. They usually have a negative effect, but they also have a powerful effect that actually ends up being revealing and, and exposing more truth on matters. Well, that would be great, <laughs> especially when you're talking about 2,000 years from now, if we're on the upswing and we're reaching some sort of silver age, as you said, it's very hard for me to to project that far and to actually see what the hell happens from now until then to turn things around. But I guess there's plenty of times to turn things around. And whereas um, I think right now what we're seeing is that there's like a culturally, there's like a, a fork in the road. And there are people who are taking are taking the path toward asking bigger more bolder questions doing, you know, uh, I think far more uh, meaningful work on themselves and and everything else and others who are slipping into this this hellish hamster wheel of <laughs> I don't know, it, it, it's not even human thought. It's really just just fried circuitry. And uh, it, it's concerning because, you know, they are uh, still capable people that are frustrated ignorant and angry are still capable of doing tremendous damage because you can't reach them and they're just ready to blow. So I can see how we're set up for a lot of conflict now and hopefully at the other end of it, who knows when that is. Um, so I guess sometimes in the next 2000 years, the globalists will be put in their place. Here's the hoping. Let well, me I don't know about 2000 years. <laughs> oh, I hope okay. it's a lot sooner than that. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Well, they, they get put there. You know, if you look back through history, this is really good and evil. It's never the, the, the Garden of Eden story. And you get into the ancient legends in the Asiatic, you know, countries, uh, the Vedantic for sure, the Tibetan lamas, the Egyptian lore. There's always this story about this war in heaven. And then the spirits were cast down. That might be a lot more true than we know. And they actually say the evil spirits are forced to be right at the molecular level of this particular universe. And they claim there could be 49 parallel universes. And what's interesting about that is everything under the moon, they say, will go through birth, growth, maturity, atrophy, and death. I don't care if it's a human being, an animal, a plant, the mineral kingdom, the earth itself will always go through this cleansing and reprocessing. But the creational forces, the divine creational forces of life will never stop, at least not, not to my knowledge. And uh, if that's the case, and we go through these evolutions all the time, we're really just spiritual beings having a physical experience passing through, you know, 
We're like the cowboy passing through. And literally, these lives are very short when you look at, in totality, everything that's going on. But creation and divinity always wins. It always wins, no matter how many. You look at Mao and Hitler and, of course, Stalin. Those are some examples of just the last century or so. But you look back to the past. There's always been destroyers, conquerors, who have sought to destroy and disrupt creation and mass society. And it never is fully successful. And I think now it's much more dangerous when you look at not only the mass destruction weapons, but some of the secret weaponry that they have, the biological weapons, on and on and on, and weapons and scalar and particle beams that we've never even seen directly in action, at least not openly in a war. And this is the scary stuff. And I really believe there are forces that regulate or stop total destruction. And I think they have for probably the last 80 years. Now, that's That's been uh, what I've heard. Well, you know, the, the secret the secret wars, the secret weapons that you talk about, that all goes hand in hand with what you said we're, we're, we're dealing with right now. Um, uh, it's more so, and I've, I've said it before, I would have much rather had a uh, an international an internationally cobbled together army try to invade the United States, try to take over Europe, to actually have some, uh, you know, to have a uniform, to have an identifiable patch, something like that. Because the the secrecy and the mind games of what we're going through right now is really it's just incredible. Um, like you said, the biologicals right now they're 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 talking about the bird flu, you know, it's passing to something. Is it going to start jumping over to humans? So we're playing that game all over again. The cyber attacks, the uh, you know, the war on multiple fronts, the wild card that is the border. Anything can come through a border uh, like this. Probably has a hundred million times over. They're at this flying point. them right in. <laughs> I know. I, hey, listen, I live in Westchester, they're New York. Them. <laughs> I live in Westchester, New York. They're, they're, they are they're being they're they're touching down. Five miles down the road, so um, yep. it's it's crazy. It really is crazy. That's that's part of the secret war. It's engineered. There. It's engineered by the UN. Uh, I'm telling you, we're we're in a psyops like we've never seen before, and this is an out and out attempt to destroy this country. Will it be successful? We'll wait and see. I tend to say the scales tip more in the favor of the phoenix rising out of the ashes. You know, and these eclipse points all tie together too. There's a lot of numerology to them. The 2000, in fact, if you go back through all the eclipses and tie them together, which is a mammoth job, it's all very complex numerology. And it's all marching forward on the evolution of souls. In fact, I believe if we get, ever get the axis tip, and I've been hearing about that for 50, 60 years, it's never happened yet. Now, even though the magnetics have moved a lot, if we ever get either a slow or if we get a rapid axis tip, you and I are not going to be talking uh, next time. But if we get a slow one, this, this is what's going to change and shift consciousness on this planet. I actually believe the position of the Earth's angularity and the moon's angularity, they're called the obliquity of the ecliptic. It's a fancy term that just means the angles that they're all at. That's why these eclipses only happen in totality like today in very special conditions. You have to have an exact alignment. And notice it's only in certain places of the globe. It only striped across the center of the United States up, up into the Atlantic, right? And across the Yucatan out into the Pacific, the South Pacific. So unless you're right in those vicinities, usually within 150, 200 miles either side of that thing, you're not going to see it fully. Like out here in California, we saw it, but it was nowhere near total. Well, let and me that's because... We're out in the fifty percent area. Oh well, I was in the ninety percent area. It's still pretty impressive, but I, like I was yeah. saying before, it's incredible what five to ten percent of the sun provides because it goes from it must go from like two percent, then suddenly it's just blacked out. I thought that we would be near nighttime with ten percent left, but no, it was very bright still. But I, I, let me ask you this because you, you brought up something that I've been wondering about. When you're analyzing the link between um, the movement above and the activity of mankind below over here on, on Earth's surface. Do eclipses only really matter when they're passing over major population centers? And I ask you this for a number of no. reasons. Because... I, no. Be, okay. So what? Yeah. So, go ahead. I think they're most intense there. But see, in your birth chart, especially in Nadi astrology and Vedic astrology, here my camera just died out. Let me just restart. 
um, in Vedic astrology or in Nadi astrology, you have to look at the house that it happens in. See, in astrology, there's 12 houses. They each rule an area of life. And you might say, okay, great. What does it mean? Well, like the first house is the self. The fourth house is your home and family. The 10th house is career. The seventh is partnerships and relationships. See, the fifth is speculation. The second is money. So whenever the eclipse happens, it's going to happen in all of our houses, respectively, where it is. And the aspects it makes to your birth chart is huge, absolutely huge. So like, for instance, if it happens in the 12th house, it could be hidden psychological things that are going to be cropping their heads up over the next year or two. See, the duration of the eclipse, the exact time that was through the center of the sun, they actually say if it takes an hour, that's a year. If it takes an hour and a half, that's about a year and a half. So this actually happened in what we call a mutable sign in sidereal astrology, which means it's middling. It's not going to be a little over. It's going to be maybe just a little bit under a year per hour. So this eclipse lasted quite a long time in the center of where it happened, if you were right under it. It was a little over an hour. Mm. So it's quite powerful by the time it entered and then left. So this is, you know, one of the measurements. I don't know if I agree 100% with all those deductions, but it does seem to hold water pretty close to that. So the effect of the eclipse, no matter where you are on the globe, it's still wherever that new moon happened, it's going to happen in one of the 12 houses in everyone's birth chart. If the eclipse makes good aspects, now you might say, well, what is that? Well, trines 120 degree aspects, very good. Sex, sextiles, which are 60, also very good. Um, squares are challenges. Oppositions can be very challenging conjunctions to certain planets in your chart could have huge effects on you. So it's going to affect everyone uniquely and individually. There's actually angels that rule every single degree of the sidereal zodiac. And you can look at the angel that that happened on in your birth chart. It's pretty wild stuff. And I have to say this eclipse has a revealing quality. It's almost kind of a, uh, you could say, an inspirational out of the blue flashes of genius type of quality. So, and this can work for the good for humanity too, because there's certainly a lot of subterfuge going on yeah. right now. And there has been, um, this is not Biden. It's the, the owners. George Carlin was right. Forget the politicians. You have owners and they do, they own everything. And it's not just Vanguard, BlackRock and, and state street. It is the bankers above that. This is where it all funnels down into. And when you control the money, as Rothschild said, he didn't care who made the laws, right? No. So, and this is what we're seeing is ever since 2020, we've been in a new era. And this is different than the Aquarian age. See, um, when the founders of this country formed the United States, there was what we call a great conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn in the very first bounds. That's called the Egyptian divisions called bounds uh, of Aries. And that ushered in the Industrial Revolution. We were eking our way back up into technology. Well, 240 years later, enters 2020. On the winter solstice of 2020, not only did we get COVID at the beginning of 2020, that was engineered too by the Saturn-Pluto conjunction. And I don't believe for a minute that that was an accident. Um, I think that was allowed to happen is one way it could be said. Yeah, because it sure lined up with the astrology, I'll tell you that. Mm. And the winter solstice of 220, we had a Jupiter-Saturn conjunction in the first degree of Aquarius, which is an air trine. See, air trines rule technology, communications, computers, AI, all the stuff we're hearing about. I've been talking about this for years. I was on Coast to Coast God like uh, four, 14, 15 years ago. And George said to me, Jeff, what do you think of the Mayan calendar? I said, not a single thing. I said, watch out for 220 forward. And the reason why, in 2020, we had a Saturn-Pluto conjunction combined with a Saturn-Jupiter conjunction. Plain English, Saturn and Jupiter happen every 20 years. For astrologers who are listening, they're going to go, wait a minute, you know, he's wrong. Every 20 years, Jupiter and Saturn come together. He, they're right, but not in those configurations. This goes all the way back to the flood of Noah 
and before. They knew when Jupiter and Saturn joined in very specific bounds of the Egyptian zodiac, there would be major changes in society. And the first one we had in a long time, over a thousand years, was the Industrial Revolution in the 1700s. The last one we just had was the winter solstice of 2020. This is why right now everyone sounds like the Pelicans in Saving Nemo. You know, AI, AI, AI. That's all they do is say AI. AI is everywhere. And we're seeing an explosion of technology on every front. And this is why, because we had that conjunction. It's like the psyche, or you could say the consciousness has expanded now, and everybody's pushing on that that wavefront of let, super high tech. Let me ask you this: um, there's a, yep. there's a couple of questions in here. I want to be able to get through them because at the top of the hour, I don't I don't know how much time you have tonight, but uh, uh, I guess I, I can hold you over to the other side of intermission for a few minutes if you still have some time. But still, um, yep, I can make it. There's a few things I I the first thing was this. You know, my friend Max, he's an astrophysicist. He was on the <laughs> show with us on Friday night. And when he was explaining what kind of data would be gathered by these rockets that were launched today, because he actually worked on some of the the packet technology that the um, the payload that um, that ended up inside of some of these rockets, um, he said that pretty much we, we were shown a graphic of the moon passing over the United States in 2017, <laughs> and of course the, the moon was just su superimposed over it because it it. it what it was supposed to show is this wavy, cloudy, I guess, I guess a cloudy wave of electromagnetic activity that was being mm -hmm. measured on a spectrometer. So, uh, so pretty much he was showing the physical impact that a, a an eclipse has as it passes over. Now, now I look at that and I say, well, hey, if a run of the mill full moon can make emergency rooms go wild, then right. I, a, a, an eclipse must have some kind of physical effect on humans as well. Oh, it does. But, yeah. but at the same time, you know, you just said it doesn't matter in the world where it is. I, I just I just didn't know, you know, I, if no one really pays attention to an eclipse when it's happening over a random part of the Pacific Ocean, uh, I, just, I just figured that there would be a little bit more of a, because uh, there's a couple of eclipses every year, no? Yeah. Well, not yeah. There, there are what we call a, a palette clips, uh, eclipses or applause is the correct name for them, right? But they're partial eclipses. See, total eclipses don't happen very often, and when they do, they're localized right to a specific area on Earth. And if you're not in that pattern, and what I meant to say, and I'm not saying the physics of you know magnetics and propagation of electricity and all this other stuff isn't possible because it certainly is. And I, I really believe it is. I could feel it today. When that thing came in, I could just feel the energy coming in. It was really powerful. But let's say you're on the other side of the world or you're outside of where you're going to see that eclipse, you know, darken down the sun. It's still going to affect the entire world. The, the world is always rotating. And even if you're a flat earther, you, when you look at the model of astrology, there's 12 houses Six are above the horizon, six are below the horizon. So depending on where you are in the earth, like if you were in the central part of the United States, Texas and Missouri and all that path of the eclipse, you're going to be right underneath it. That means the sun would have been close to at noon or just a little after, depending on the time zone you were in. So it's going to be very strong there. But astrology doesn't just work off of magnetics. See, hard sciences are always looking at the electro magnetic spectrums and frequencies and all that. And I'm not saying this stuff isn't true, because it certainly is. But I think when we look at planets and you take it up to a much higher level, see, Vedic astrology and Nadi astrology says planets are actually called graha. That's a very ancient word in Tamil and Sanskrit that means Caesar or grasper of the aura, or more specifically, a portal at which soul force energy comes through. So even though we have the magnetics and the light and all the spectra coming through through the suns, I think they're portals to the upper yet seratic worlds. If I was to show you the hierarchical tree of creation, first you have divinity or God, if you want to call it that. Beneath that, you have a, a world called absolute, extremely powerful, divine, creative force, forces and energy. Beneath that, you have the Briah, which is where the waters of creation and all the forces get much more dense. 
then you have the Yetziratic worlds. Now, the Yetzir is a strange word. Many people who are familiar with some of the Kabbalistic documents may have heard of a text called the Sefer Yetzirah. That means the Book of Formation in plain English. And in that, it talks about the magic of five, or you could say six-dimensional space, and the coalition of all of the atomic matter. This is where all the amino acids and atoms and molecules and neutrinos and all the forces of electromagnetism and many other things all come together. And it's also the building blocks of life. And what's fascinating is I believe the celestial heavens are portals to that. And the fabric science, hard science, is never going to be able to measure is the etheric energy of the soul, the spirit, and the psyche. So the astrology for me, for you, for everyone else, is going to be completely unique to the transmissional forces of the soul force energy coming through, which connects to your soul roots, which could be hundreds and hundreds of dimensions above anything astrological. So we're dealing, I always say, forget Trinity, Neo, and Morpheus. We're dealing with a matrix here that's far, far more complex than just gravity, electromagnetism, and you know electricity, and gamma rays, and all these other measurable things that we know about. I think it's far beyond that. Well, let and me... proof of it is, you look at the naughty astrology, it's so accurate, it's creepy how the effects are on people. The, uh, <laughs> a part of the... A part of the um, the symbolism, I would I would say, that has come out in this is, of course, the X pattern that has been since 2017 painted. Uh, actually, there was three different uh, eclipse paths that were painted over the United States. One forms the X, and the third one forms the anarchy sign, the the A. Mm -hmm. um, right. But but as far as the X goes, from 2017 to 2024. Um, I've had a couple of questions that came in from the audience that wanted to know about what your take on whether it be scriptural or anything else like that, uh, the completing of the X pattern across America, if that in has any kind of weight in itself, if the point, the center point of the X is any kind of uh, significant uh, waypoint, or is it, it does it not matter? It's just the, the overall the, the movement. Uh, what do you think well, about it? it? Well, I, I, I know a lot of people have you know speculated it could mean the New Madrid fault going again, which had, had gone before. And it could affect, I, I think we could see increased seismic activity. I don't know if we're going to see it today. Now, we certainly didn't from anywhere that I've heard. But I think we have an arc of alignment going on with all the planets that are interrelated to this eclipse. If you look in the sky, everything, there's a great app you can get. It's called uh, Skyview. A lot of people have it. You can get it on your iPhone or your Droid. And you can see all the planets are in about a maybe a 60 to 70 degree arc right now, really tight, all pulling against the Earth and, of course, the sun on the other side. So this is going to go on. It's not really going to break up a lot until probably right at the end of June. So seismic activity, erratic weather patterns are much more pronounced. And the weather's been really strange I mean, when you look at it. It's been pretty wacky. I know out here in California, in 40-something years, I have never seen the weather as unusual as it's been. The amount of rain we've got, the winds that we've gotten. We always get winds out here. But the rain has just been unprecedented. It's been really substantial. Not to where it's actually setting untold records. I mean, they, there's, you know, it's not, it's not like it's biblical or anything, but it's pretty substantial. And I think... Um, as far as the eclipses go, I think this is a bigger riddle. I, I think it's relating to where we're heading in 2027, 28, and also in 2036, because these are related to events that are going to happen in the next several years. We've got a Saturn-Pluto square, 27, 28, and then we have another one in 236 to 238. These are long periods of time. And I think these eclipses tie in. And it's interesting that this eclipse series began in 1501. I'd have to go back and research where the uh, beginning of the 217 eclipse and the 220 began. But I think they're all related. And oh, numerologically, they are tied together, I think, by about 1,100-year mathematics. They're almost 1,100 years apart 
when we look at where the or uh, days, I think it's days that um, yeah, 1100 days that they're tied apart. So it's it's pretty wild how this stuff works out. And uh, yeah, I don't have that data right in front of me, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. I think the eclipses are definitely always a powerful time of karmic release that unfolds for each individual and nations collectively over a year or two of time. And uh, I think the biggest one I don't like about this is Mars is going to cross the eclipse point. That's a trigger right in May. And from what I see in the United States, we could see a lot of trouble here from May forward because I think this election year is going to be a circus. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because you had mentioned that the, the you you had said we could really see the fireworks from May May onward, and um, I know you you've had some pretty you've made some pretty bold statements about what we're going to be looking at between I think February and March 2025. Like what what 2025 actually really means after we get past all of the hurdles that are thrown in front of us right now. But I you know one last question before we go to break. In this next five minutes, um, you already, whether you're talking about the United States, the formation of the United States uh, back in the 18th century, whether you're talking about something right now, um, you mm. bring up you bring up the alignment of Pluto a lot. And of course, maybe we had talked about this a year, a couple of years ago. I don't know. Um, but it seems that that is a very, very uh, significant planet in a lot of your work and of course just across the your your trade there um what what does the the waffling back and forth of the scientific community of demoting pluto uh yeah. mean to you and your work what, what is it because obviously any there's a i lot don't care of, i mean i i know scientists there's two camps they, they they always seem to say no it's not a planet and the others say no it's a planetary we should put it back as a planet um I, I, I go by observation. I, I don't really care. Astronomers pretty much laugh at astrology. They they don't think it has any efficacy at all. They think it's nonsense. They're into left brain hard science. So, and I actually am too. In fact, when I first got into astrology, I was very much into science and physics and electronics and music and all kinds of stuff. And, you know, I, I really thought it was bunk too and started until I started looking at the accuracy of it. It does show background energies. And when you look at uh, Pluto's only been discovered here, you know, since what, the uh, early 1900s. So it hasn't been around that long. But if you go back engineer and you look at data, it's pretty overwhelming what happens. And when I do readings for people and I see a Pluto transit or a Pluto aspect in their chart, it's undeniable. So no matter what the astronomers want to call it, because they don't believe in astrology anyhow, uh, I would say that it really shows up almost invariably in any time I see, especially in location astrology or in hard aspects to a birth chart. And I would also say to people, did you think COVID had any effect? That was a Saturn-Pluto conjunction. Do you know that the United States, the Federal Reserve Act in World War I happened right, right in between a Pluto-Saturn conjunction. And they happen about every 38 years. And depending on the configurations, you go, you go forward, you, you'll see it, major events always happen on them. And it's undeniable. 9-11 happened on a Saturn-Pluto opposition. So it doesn't matter if we call Pluto whatever we want to call it. You can call it a figment in the sky. One thing's for sure is the math adds up to it. 9-11 uh, happened. And I'll, I'll never forget, I was walking across the room on, a, on the cell phone talking to a friend of mine uh, in Wall Street. He was a Wall Street astrologer, uh, Arch Crawford. And I said, something's going to happen here. Sure enough, the next day, boom, boom, we see the tower smoldering and coming down, down like sparklers from jet fuel which is a little unusual anyhow. But anyhow, we won't get into that one. But um, it happened right on a Saturn-Pluto opposition. The banks in 2008 crashed on the Saturn-Pluto square. We had Nixon take us off the gold standard in the 70s on a Saturn-Pluto aspect. I could keep going on and on and on. It's pretty well. Uh, again, when we go back and engineer the... Um, the fall of the Roman Empire, both times, the first time it divided, the second time it dissolved was on Pluto returns on the Roman Empire. 
there's a lot there's a lot there and i have so much more to ask um it, it'll be a really good second half jeff i'm going to put you on on mute just for a little bit and i'll carry you on on the other side of the intermission thank you so much for doing some extra time with us I, 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 you know i i guess it was my own fault for thinking that you and i can have a substantive conversation within 20 minutes uh <laughs> but, but it's, I'm, I'm glad you're here we will be right back ladies and gentlemen there's a lot more in the second half now with Jeff, including taking your calls and reading your super chats. So hop over to pill.net or quite frankly, TV real quick. It's two clicks away. There's no paywall. There's no strings attached. Just press play. You can chat wherever the hell you want. Chat in the gilded chat, wherever uh, this episode will be uploaded in its entirety later on tonight on podcast, rumble, rock, fin, bit shoot, all the rest. Uh, but there ain't nothing like live. So click over and watch the rest. We will be right back the rest of the show is available exclusively at pill.net follow the link in the description of the episode get signed up it's that easy or head on over to quite frankly tv just press play no paywalls no censorship no strings attached so head on over quite frankly tv powered by foxhole and pill.net It's intermission time, folks. Time out to press the like button. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to intermission. We'll, we'll be right back. Quite frankly. 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 